So what is going on in this picture? Anybody have any ideas? Mummy fight? Like they're conserving the body um, when they're dead, I believe? Um, is it the infection of smallpox? Yes, it is the infection of smallpox. So both this and the next slide, this one right here, Yeah, this slide right here um, shows a smallpox infection drawn from the perspective of indigenous people. Um, we're going to be talking today about the Colombian exchange, about the first interactions between Europeans and people of the Americas. And the main point that I have for you to take away from today's lecture is European contact was a demographic disaster for Native Americans, largely due to biological reasons that um, viruses and bacteria were the first to colonize and they wiped out a lot of the Native Americans. So that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Another part is what the Europeans were doing out of Europe anyway, what um, kind of society they had, how it was changing, how that motivated them to leave Europe. And then finally, what kinds of exchanges took place between Europeans and indigenous peoples? All right, so those are the three parts of today's lecture that you're going to take away with you. Okay. Well, what were the Europeans doing out of Europe anyway? To understand this, we have to look at the structure of their society up until the time that European exploration really started. And the, what we designate that society as, in retrospect, is feudalism. Feudalism, a very fixed and static hierarchical society based on various different roles that people and classes had. So there is a really good, um, yes, we have started in-person class today, Carson, and there haven't been any changes. Sorry for the interruption, no problem. Okay. Um, you can see in this very good, uh, this very good diagram here, the king is at the top of the feudal structure. He owns all the land in the kingdom. And we're talking about multiple European kingdoms here, as I'm going to show you. The king grants land to the highest level of aristocracy, the barons. And they, in turn, grant land to the knights. And underneath the knights, we have serfs or villains or peasants. What they're called really just depends on the society that we're looking at in the time period. And then every lower class owes some kind of feudal obligation to the class above it. So peasants have to work on the land. They are not allowed to leave. They are born onto estates. They owe a certain number of days of service something often called a corvée, to their feudal lords. So they have to build roads and bridges and cathedrals. And they have to ask permission to marry. So the under the feudal structure, the, the rights of the people at the bottom of the totem pole were quite constricted. Question. Yeah. Um, I don't think the camera's doing anything. It said no signal. I mean, right now I'm sharing the screen, but I'm not sure why it says no signal on the camera. So do you want to that later? Um, no, I can keep talking if you want to figure out what's wrong. I don't have to be centrally located. Okay, and then the knights and the barons both owe protection and military service to the, um, to the group above them, 
The most important thing here is that there is no social mobility. If you are a king, you're not going to be demoted. If you are a, a baron, you're not going to become king, that sort of thing. Oh, do you need to stop the share to? All right. Professor, I have a question. Sure. Um, indentured service servants, sorry, uh, were they part of the villains or like the peasants and the lord in the lord category, like below? We don't really have indentured servants yet. Oh, okay. Servants pop up in the post exploration period. So for what will later become the United States, indentured servitude starts in the in the early 1600s, goes through part of the 1700s. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, what is it? Okay. There is an all. So it has to be on there. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, um, good question about the indentured servants. And then on the side here of the slide, you see that there's a church. The church, the Catholic church was the church in Europe at this time. And the role of the church was to pray for people. And the role of the people was to support the church. So a very static system. Other questions so far? All right, so here you get a sense of how many kingdoms at this point and petty principalities there were in Europe. This is showing you um, how many Small states there were around 1470 AD. And these kingdoms are all in competition with each other for resources. It's really hard to take over all of Europe. Even much later in time, we saw both Napoleon and Hitler have issues trying to do that. There are geographical uh, impediments to doing that. But these geographical impediments lead to these small kingdoms being in competition. This proto-arms race among these kingdoms in competition caused European rulers to try to find ways to uh, maximize their advantage. So, for example, one of the ways in which they could do this was seeking extra resources. And seeking resources was one of the one of the things that's going to get the Europeans out of Europe. So the title of this slide, what were the Europeans doing out of Europe anyway? That's one of the things. A second change that starts to take place in the 1400s is the emergence of new ways of organizing society economically. So for example, it became okay to enrich oneself for the sake of either the kingdom or even one's personal wealth. Previously, previous to say the 1450s, if somebody got a lot of money, they would generally speaking give it to the church. People believed that masses needed to be said for their souls, sometimes for years, so that they could leave purgatory and go on to heaven. And so they would endow chapels and they would um, pay for masses to be said for their souls. But now this new entrepreneurial class begins to grow up among the aristocracy, seeking to develop trade with other parts of the world. There was the silk trade. There was the spice trade. Much of the commerce that moved around Europe at this time was basic 
uh, resources. Not the luxuries meant for the emperor, which were the subject of exploration in the Far East. There was also a lot of trade between the Muslim world and Europeans, because this was a time when um, the Muslim world had, or you know, people from North Africa had penetrated into Spain. There had been a very long Muslim presence in southern Spain, and um, the Islamic world was doing a lot of trade at this time. Capitalism, we kind of know what that means, you know, that that, that is a term that's familiar to us. But mercantilism also began, begins to arise in this time period, which is the idea of exploiting colonies for the benefit of a mother country. When European um, kingdoms and principalities began to explore, they were looking for ways to maximize their own advantage through especially finding gold and silver for their own national reserves. But they find other kinds of resources as well. And the point of mercantilism is not really to develop the colony, but rather to do everything for the benefit of the mother country. Okay. Questions? Another thing that begins to develop in the late 1400s is new Renaissance humanism. People are still profoundly religious, but there begins to be an emphasis on what humanity is capable of. That not everything is necessarily guided by God, but that humans with their big brains are capable of great feats of engineering, architecture, learning, And this emphasis on humanism puts the individual at the center of the universe. You can't really have exploration or you know, leaving Europe and finding colonies and exploiting indigenous people unless you feel like, okay, humans can do that. God doesn't prohibit it. We're not gonna fall off the edge of the world. There were a few other changes that were responsible for the Europeans being out of Europe. The development of bureaucratic technology, things like bookkeeping, double entry bookkeeping, systems of taxation, systems of keeping track of the nation's wealth are developed at this time and make it possible to fund these kinds of expeditions. Mechanical printing is also important. There were remarkable individuals who got the idea into their head that they should seek uh, aristocratic or royal patronage to go and complete whatever it is they had in mind. You guys know that Columbus thought he was looking for China a quick route to China, thought that the people that he met in the islands in the Caribbean were from India. So he had kind of like a wrong idea of how large the globe was. But he went back to the, um, the king and queen of Spain who had just unified their kingdoms, Ferdinand and Isabella, and he went back to them several times to um, get patronage for them to be able to carry out his voyages. The development of maritime technology was important. The Portuguese in particular were great at building these ships called caravels, which were capable of traveling really long distances. You also had development of navigational skills And then finally, enthusiastic religion 
the idea that we need to convert as many souls as possible was something that was motivating many Europeans. And this particularly became true once Protestantism had emerged in the 15 teens. You begin to have rivalries between large nations. The Spanish and the English are a great example. As the English had come up with their own non-Catholic religion by the 1530s. Okay, questions? Any questions from the Zoom people? No, ma'am. All right, so now I'm going to talk about two groups of Europeans who uh, explored what is today North America. And we're going to save the story for um, lecture three, which is next week. All right, so the Spanish, the Portuguese and the Spanish really were the major explorers starting in the 1400s. But the Spanish, the, the Portuguese end up going to India and eastward and they go to Africa. So the Spanish are the ones who are coming to the West, to the Americas. And what they hope to achieve for the glory of Spain was to find gold and silver wherever they were going to go in the Americas. Hernan Cortez and his company of explorers were searching for gold, eventually met up with a very, very um, complex civilization, and that of the Aztecs of Mexico. They teamed up with the Aztecs local indigenous uh, rival group. There was a death struggle for mastery. And within two years, Cortes and his small army of conquistadors were able to overthrow the vast Aztec Empire. What did the Spanish hope to do once they got a foothold and discovered there really wasn't a lot of gold? Well, they decided to um, create a system in miniature of what existed in Spain. And this was called the Encomienda system. The encomienda system was a system of land grants so that um, Spanish noblemen who moved to North and South America would get a certain amount of land called an encomienda. And they would also receive the labor of the natives who lived on or near that land to use basically as enslaved people. If you think about it, there really is a large similarity between this and feudalism, except that the Spanish at first did not seem to consider the indigenous people to be equals with themselves. They didn't consider them to have souls in the same way. They worked them to death. So not exactly an analog of feudal peasants. Among the explorers, um, who came over and uh, interacted with native peoples in various ways were Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, a excerpt from his recollections is your primary source for this week in the discussion area. In 1527, he was appointed treasurer of an expedition that was setting off from Spain and landed in what is today Florida. It was an expedition of 300 men. They met with Native Americans in Florida who by this time due to, you know, isolated contacts with the Spanish and other Europeans knew that what the Europeans wanted was gold and other treasure. So the indigenous people said to them, yeah, okay, it's several, several weeks march to the north, go that way. Well, the 
expedition that Cabeza de Vaca was on with their 300 men kind of got stranded in the woods. They ran out of food. They ended up eating their horses. A lot of them died. They made rafts and they floated back down, um, back down to the southeastern portion of the United States. And then there were very few left. They were taken captive by indigenous people. And by the time you get to the um, part of the story that I've given you for this week's primary source, there were like four guys left. And Cabeza de Vaca was one of them. Over the next few years, Cabeza de Vaca and Estebanico, who was an enslaved um, African Spaniard who was brought on the trip, and two other guys made their way from Florida all the way through Texas over land, what is today Texas, and ended up in what is today Northern Mexico, where they reunited with another Spanish settlement. And they went through this um, by means that he describes in the primary source. So I'm not going to talk about it and let you guys pull out the story of how exactly that happened. He then wrote one of the first ethnographies of the Native Americans in North America. And eventually, he became a governor of some territory in Spain. The Relacion that was written by Cabeza de Vaca became one of the first inside documents about the nature of life of the Native Americans because he had no choice but to live among them as one of them if he wanted to be able to survive. And it led to a large debate in Spanish society over whether Native Americans had souls in the same way that the Spanish understood themselves to have souls, and whether they should be converted. All right, so Cabeza de Vaca is one example. De Soto is another example. In 1539, he was the leader of a, a group of 600 explorers who arrived on the west coast of what is now Florida. They searched for gold and silver for about four years, eventually getting as far north as Tennessee and North Carolina. DeSoto died on the expedition and the, the remainder of the people um, with the expedition reunited in Mexico with other Spanish settlers. And then Coronado, um, started looking for gold in Texas, ended up going north as far as Kansas, didn't find any gold. So you'll notice two things about Spanish exploration. They set up the encomienda system in places where they didn't find gold, and they spent a lot of time looking for gold. Okay. Questions? The French explorers, they were eager to explore the new world for possible treasure and to increase the glory of their nation and of the Catholic Church, but they had a slightly different attitude about interactions with the Native peoples. The French sent a lot of Jesuits to places like what is now Canada. And they worked alongside the Native Americans, kind of combining their own Catholic beliefs with Native American traditions and stories in order to like emphasize why they should convert. They were successful in a different way than the Spanish, who when they built the missions in California just ended up rounding people up and penning them into uh, mission compounds and not letting them leave. The French also were much more interested in trading than they were in setting up societies in North America. The main things that they were trading or doing were fishing, 
off the coast of Newfoundland and other places in what is now Eastern Canada and the Maritimes. And also trading for furs. The Native Americans were an integral part of a proto-market economy that they set up, that the French set up. They especially wanted beaver skins or beaver pelts because beaver hats were all the rage in Europe. Native Americans knew where to get these, how to hunt them, really ended up hunting them almost to extinction, but set up trading networks by which they got things like guns and pots and other European manufactured products. Okay, what was the impact of the Colombian exchange on the indigenous people? Well, nobody exactly knows how many people lived in, let's say, North America before the advent of the Europeans. It was at least a million people. And about 90% of those people died over the next 200 years. Some of them died in the very short term, largely due to disease, because Native Americans had never been exposed to certain microbes before, due to the nature and viruses, due to the nature of migration, they had been isolated on the North American and South American continents for a long time. So not just things like smallpox, but what we call childhood illnesses of early Renaissance Europe, things like measles, mumps, influenza, became pandemics for the Native Americans and, and killed many of them. What else do you think what are some other reasons why there was a demographic disaster? What do you think the other causes of population decline might have been? I don't think on what you said, that we didn't look at them as people. Like we decided that they didn't have souls. That's a really odd concept. Yes. Yes, when you take people's land, when you take their resources, they have trouble surviving. They may have to move to other areas if they manage to survive where they're not familiar with the, the flora and the, the fauna. And the dying off, especially of elders, leads to a, a lack of being able to pass down cultural traditions that allow people to survive for hundreds of thousands of years. What else? Zoom people, you got any ideas? I think violence plays a bigger part than we give it credit for. Excellent, yes. There was a lot of violence that occurred. There was a lot of straight out killing. It's interesting to note that there have been rivalries among Native American groups before the advent of the Europeans, but the European contact kind of facilitates Native American groups trying to use the Europeans against their indigenous enemies. That's exactly what happened with the Aztec Empire, and it happens uh, throughout North America as well. We're going to see it happen with the Powhatan Indians when we get to Lecture 3. Okay, good. Um, now we're going to talk about the Colombian Exchange, which is called the Colombian Exchange because it's associated in the um, historian mind with um, a book by uh, David Crosby. Crosby? I want whichever Crosby isn't the Crosby from Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. I always get this confused. But anyway, Crosby in the early 1970s wrote a book about the Columbian Exchange where he talked about all kinds of different 
things that were exchanged between Europe and North America. Some of the things that were exchanged, plants. There was a huge influx of crops into Europe from uh, North America. The white potato, corn, vanilla and chocolate, squash, peppers, tomatoes, crops that actually are medicinal like quinine, crops that were thought to be medicinal like tobacco. So all of these things were brought to Europe from the Americas and from Europe to the Americas we have crops like rice, wheat, barley, oats, coffee, believe it or not, bananas. Okay, so the thing about plants, does anybody here know about salt cedar? Yeah. So say something about salt cedar. Well, it's an invasive species. Yeah. And it uses a lot of water. Exactly. A lot of water. If you look at the Rio Grande, there used to be cottonwoods in abundance along the Rio Grande River. Salt cedar was brought in as a decorative plant, and it really overtook the, the environment there. And it drank up a lot of the water, killed a lot of the cottonwoods, displaced a lot of the um, birds and other you know, creatures that lived in the sort of cottonwood um, environment. And they're really hard to eradicate. There's been a lot of attempts at eradicating salt cedar, but it's like impossible. It's very hardy. They have that one bug from they only eat salt cedars, but they won't release them because it's another invasive. Yeah, there's always that unintended <laughs> consequence of the yeah. thing that you introduce to eat the thing that you introduce by accident. Yeah. So, for example, uh, rabbits in Australia. I forget why rabbits were brought in, but they overran the whole country, and a rabbit proof fence had to be uh, erected down the mid section of the Australian continent to deal with the unintended consequence of the rabbits. Okay, there was also an exchange of technology or goods. Um, Europeans brought back things like canoes, snowshoes, moccasins, hammocks, kayaks, toboggans, arcas. You will notice these are all indigenous language words. Native Americans, in turn, acquired iron goods, guns and gunpowder, beads that became an integral part of their money system. There was an interchange of animals. Native Americans had not seen horses, although there had been horses on the North American and South American continent like 20,000 years ago. Horses had died out, and so they came over again with the Europeans, and as you guys know, they became an integral part of the culture of, for example, the Plains Indians. Cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, all coming in from European contact. Europeans, in turn, had never seen things like iguanas, flying squirrels, rattlesnakes, hummingbirds, bison. There were millions of bison in North America before the 19th century. People complained about not being able to um, have railroads run safely because there were so many bison. And then finally, there was an interchange of people. 
Many times during wars between Europeans and Native Americans, captives would be taken for the purposes of ransom. When European peoples were taken captive by Native Americans, they tended, especially if they were women or young children, to be adopted into the tribe to replace members of the tribe who had been killed. And what we notice is that some of these European captives did not want to go back. They found the way of life among the indigenous people to be much preferable. There was less physical discipline, the clothes were more comfortable, the relationships were more loving. In contrast, when Native Americans were taken captive by the English, or later when they were moved into so-called praying towns, to be dressed in European clothes, converted to Christianity, and sent to school, they tended to really not like it and to want to go back to their homes. Part of this was that they were treated very explicitly as second-class citizens who were not up to the same level of intelligence or moral, um, moral worth as European people. Uh, this varies a lot by um, which European country we're talking about. In Spain, or in New Spain, there was a lot of intermarriage between um, the Spanish and the native women, and also some descendants of later um, African slaves. But the Spanish always had in their mind that the whiter and more Spanish you were, the better you were. I don't know if any of you have seen the Costa paintings that proliferated in um, what is now Latin America uh, throughout the 1700s and 1800s, but they show all kinds of different intermixtures of people, and every kind of intermixture has a name. Um, so uh, the Spanish, the um, Spanish from Spain are at the top of the um, uh, top of the sort of hierarchy of racial importance, and it goes down from there. The French were much more open to considering the native peoples as their equals, although later when the British come in to Canada, they considered those um, mixed peoples, the Métis, to be um, culturally inferior to themselves. Among the English, there is going to be very little intermarriage between the English and indigenous people. So finally, when you don't have a situation where the English have overwhelming superiority of numbers or technology, when they're still trying to establish a foothold, and this happens again and again in American history. A cultural middle ground is forged between the Europeans and the Native Americans in which nobody's culture is able to be completely dominant. There's a lot of cultural negotiation that goes on. It is necessary for the survival of the Europeans that they um, acknowledge indigenous customs rely on indigenous hospitality. As we're going to see when we talk about the English in Jamestown, they would never have persisted had it not been for the Powhatan Indians helping them. Anybody have any idea who these people are on the slide? On the left, isn't that Hernan Cortes? Um, no, good guess, though. And yes. Uh, that is Pocahontas and John, John Smith. I'm going to talk more about Pocahontas in Lecture 3, but she went to England, was presented at court, and had her portrait painted. So that is actual Pocahontas painted from life. And that is John Smith. I'm not sure whether that portrait was painted from life or not. 
but I'll talk more about them. Clearly, they look nothing like the people in the Disney movie. And was she also taken away from her tribe? Yes. We're going to see she's kidnapped from her tribe. She is converted to Christianity, renamed Rebecca, married off to one of the tobacco planters, and becomes kind of this cultural middle ground herself through which um, peace is brokered between the Powhatan Indians and the English. All right, what I want to do today um, for the next 12 minutes is to show you a short video about the Columbian Exchange, after which we'll have time for questions. So let me do that. <laughs> 